I grew up in a little town west of Minneapolis, about 110 miles, called Sacred Heart. Not only worked in town, my father and I also worked, had a farm a mile and a half from town. And when we got tired of living in town, we'd move out to the farm and do some farming. I plowed with a team of horses and a walking plow. It was the boy that walked, not the plow, by the way. And uh, when the horses got tired, I thought the old man wasn't looking. I'd lie down and let the horses breathe in a dream about somebody from the outside world coming up with some fast-stepping horses and tell me we're just been looking for a boy that'll go out with us and with our circus. And how would you like it? Oh, it'd be wonderful. And uh, so forth and so on. By that time, the dream was over, time to go home and uh, do the uh, chores at night. So, when I became 21, I followed in my father's footsteps and went up to northwestern North Dakota, right up on the Canadian border, and homesteaded near a little railroad town called Crosby. Just a day or two ago, I was rummaging around in some old papers of mine, and I came upon an old diary I didn't even know I had. It was written by a fellow I had known up there on the claim, near Crosby, name of Ray Sorensen. Ray's father, Hendrick, had come up there in the 90s so by now, Ray, together with his brother John and the old man, was working a decent-sized farm while I was still living in my old sod shack. So I figured I'm not necessarily getting any younger at 94 years of age. And here was an opportunity to put down a good yarn about those old times. Good times too, almost forgotten by most folks. Times when we had the powers that be on the run. I had Ray's diary to tell most of the story for me. So I sat down at my typewriter and got started.
March 19th, 1915. Going to see Inga this afternoon. Be tough and insist on an answer. you now. You won't tell me. If you don't tell me, I'm going to put snow down your back. If you put snow down my back, I'll say no. And then I won't put snow down your back. And I won't say no. What will you say? Yes. September 5th, 1915, the day of my engagement party. We started off in the blind pig in the back of Gordon's elevator. The joke is that Gordon steals your grain from you in the front and bootlegs it back to you as booze in the rear. But he's just a flunky for the big milling boys in the Twin Cities. Small potatoes compared to those grafters. You're going to be sold on this league, aren't you? Yeah, you're going to be sold on it, too. The next few months are going to be critical. Oh, come on. Don't get started on the league again. Don't get serious on it, Sven. I'm only saying think okay, about it. Time for another toast? All right. Let's see. Here's to Ray. I told him not to do it, but he did it. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, one brother down, one to go. Here next, John. Yeah. Bye. What do you got? I'm out. Uh, <laughs> I gotta go get cleaned up. Come on, Ray. You don't want to keep Molly? Well, I'm going to stay one more hand. It's my deal, then. I'm winning. Oh, what do you got? You going to? Yeah. Uh, see, see you a little bit. See you at home, then, huh? I'll be there. Yeah, don't be late. I'll be there. Gentlemen? With John gone, Sven got going on the league again. I told him I'd join, if I won enough money. It's two, Sven. He gambled on a couple pairs, but I had three eights. Very impressive, Ray. Lay off, Sven. It's my engagement day. I never met an organizer yet with a sense of humor. Start for you. I'm going to But you should get married with Ray, so it has its own conversations. When I finally got out of there, I knew I'd be in trouble at home. And there are two things Mother doesn't tolerate, missing Grace and talking politics at the table. But Father would be all right. I could just see him, waiting to get that first drink under his belt. Yes, Amen. 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 
strange engagement party without Inga's parents there. Oli and Adelaide had decided to hire out to a thrashing crew at the last minute. Couldn't come. Anything to make ends meet. But Uncle Tor tried to cheer everybody up by telling his grass story for the hundredth time. Yeah, that the heaven, there's something for telling. It's on his story. There's on his story. Then, so, and I think I left on Steinlasse, so I am and I'm not going to kill it. It's going to be good and warm. Solar shades, so pint. Also, heard him and said, you know, I was hail, hail, then slew us, I heard like some crystalling in grass. I couldn't understand what it was. I was thinking about it, I stood and thought, there are new grass that comes up under the old grass, so lift it a little bit, and so it goes like, so I heard that grass was. Nej, det är sant då. Det är så sant som vi sett här. Så behövs det toast. Vad är det? Behövs det toast? Well, if there's a toast you want, then you'll have a toast. <laughs> Here's to Inga and Ray. Good people. Skål! Skål! But make sure, Ray. That you make love like a Viking marauder. For my part, I have, uh, I have uh, written, uh, I've, uh, I've written a poem. Uh, so uh, <laughs> here goes. <coughs> Oli was a hunter who hunted the buffalo. But Lena hunted Oli and laid the poor boy low. And when the couple went to bed to keep their marriage pledge, Lena stayed on her own side. Oli hugged the other edge. And uh, so it went for one full year. And Lena's belly rose, and Oli's friends came by to toast the thing that they supposed. And Oli smiled, and Lena smiled, and uh, and let their neighbors know that they did sure appreciate the friends that loved them so. The next year, too, a child was born, and once more guests came by, and Oli smiled, and Lena smiled, and no one questioned why. And uh, finally, one cold winter's night, Lena turned to Oli and said, Oli, don't you want to come to my side of the bed? Said Oli, Lena dear, I am a hunter who hunts the buffalo. I learn my trade from the Indians and I do things just so. In olden times the Indians rode up and speared their prey, but now we have repeating guns, we fire from far away. So Lena dear, we have two sons by this method tried and true. I'd be nothing but a Tuscan to come and sleep with you. <laughs> to uh, Ray and Inga, skull. Poor Silas has only given Papa a month. 
Charlie Forsyth, the banker from Crosby, is demanding his mortgage payment. Coley and Adelaide can work their fingers to the bone, but only a good harvest can help them now. I come for store the inter. Yeah, I wait. Han can learn a twirl. Han can come up with tea then, dog. Yeah. Ray has already got no one to me till tagged. Han is wrong. You can't just tell a han no one to me. Han must learn a lesson. He can fail. You were your vet, Jenny. Can no one say I could get to this day? Inga, this do will harm. So Maru Hills got it. And here and go, Yalta. And you can reach it from a man. And believe me, I'm not going to break it. It's got to be got to use it. After Inga and the guests had gone, Father and I took a walk up on the hill. He drank a toast to my engagement, but asked me to hold the wedding off till after harvest. Inga's parents are too worried about mortgage payments right now. But I wonder if he knows I'm more worried about him. Jeg har det samme drøm. A little grey bird. Trying to get in. Kept trying. Then I heard him at the kitchen window. And I covered that. You still hear him banging, trying to get in. Get some sleep far. Oh, I'll leave the lamp. Tatum, I do. Good night, Bob. Go, Quell. Det er godt. Det er godt. Så 
September 15, 1915. Today we went to Oli and Adelaide's to butcher. Oli's up against it. This is the last of their pigs, the one Inga and the kids raised on a bottle. Mm -hmm. When we were through, Howard came over and started to badger me about the league again. Howard and Sven want to start organizing down around Wild Rose and they need men to help. A lot of talk, but nothing ever comes of it. Anyway, I had to get home to help father with the cattle. With grain prices down, we need the cash now. We spent the afternoon rebranding for the new owners. Get up! Get up, you devil! Now all father's got left is black toes. He's so fond of the little calf, I don't think anything could make him give it up. Country here in Endark. 
When the threshing crew gets here, we've got to be ready. Yeah, yeah. I'm so sorry, Ray. Aaron will sing the day of Galasama's sumlet head, yes and um, amen. The day after the funeral, the thrashing crew finally arrived. We worked straight up the section road and finished our place in Canutes in five days. Today, we're setting up at Oli's. The wheat is still dry and in good shape, but Oli's in bed with a high fever. Kenny, Klaus, and some of the others have rallied together to help, but Uncle Tor is afraid there's a new blizzard blowing in from Canada so there's no time to lose.
Yeah? How soon? About 10 minutes. How's your papa? He's worried. Well, don't you worry. Things will work out. Save 90% of Oli's crop. Thank God for friends and neighbors like these. Harvest dance in town tomorrow night. About time for a celebration. first 1915. Inga and I have set our wedding date, but mother won't be here. The 
farm no longer seems like home to her with Henrik gone. Her sister Amanda is sick back at the old home place in Ohio, and Mother is going to visit her for the last time. Lives go on, and now new problems have appeared. Grain prices are still down, and we've had to take out a second mortgage with Forsyth to meet expenses. The railroads have raised shipping rates to the Twin Cities again, and everyone's feeling the pinch. As times get harder, league organizers like Howard and Sven don't waste any time. But they're dreamers if they think they can fight the big money boys head on. Try to tell them that. Sorry. Sven never misses a chance to get on me about the league. Howard and I were thinking, uh, your uncle Tor Nyquist lives down on the Wild Rose Road. Yeah, that's right. Well, we don't have so many old rebel Norwegians down there. Now the threshing's done, if you'd go down there and talk to some of those men with your uncle Tor, you'd really help us get things rolling. Well, John's gonna need me at the, at the farm now. That far is dead, and uh, well, in, in a month, uh, I'm going to be a married man. Ray, you argued with me for six months before you even signed up. Now that we can use that big mouth of yours, you got nothing to say. Well, I'd, I'd like to help, but it, I just can't. I'll see you around. I've got enough problems without Sven. Inga's afraid that Forsyth might not give Ole an extension on his mortgage in spite of the good harvest. Ole can't sell his grain until prices go up, but Forsyth may not want to wait that long. Mr. Sorensen, Mr. Forsyth, I see you now. He's delinquent here. Yeah, that's three years ago. It was a bad year for everyone. Well, Ray, we get no pleasure out of foreclosure. Ole's been a good customer of yours for many years. Yeah, I know, and uh, my father knew his father. It took good to family, I understand that. He's a hard worker. He can't help Flax Wilt. I hope you'll... Uh, be able to give him a break, Charlie. Well, I'll tell you what, Ray. I'll do everything I can. Thanks, Charlie. In spite of my protests, Howard and Sven finally got me to go to a league meeting up around Kenmare over the weekend. The league program sounds good on paper. Who wouldn't want state banks, elevators, and a few good farmers in there running things instead of those stuffed shirts from Bismarck and Fargo? But is it fair to raise people's hopes if nothing can be done? Let me have it. 
drinking and arguing about workers doesn't get the work done. We're alone here now. It's just the two of us. And you've got to take on a bigger share of the load. Eat your must, John. If we work, we live. And if we don't, we die. And it's that simple. It's survival. Grain prices, short weights, dockage fees, phony grading, land speculation, mortgage rates. That's what that's what survival's about. No. That's what survival is. No, 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 no. You guys can talk through your bloom. <laughs> Tuscan. Yeah, they're part of it. Irv, you sure you get the door? Yeah, I'll get it. taking it pretty hard. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I should go talk to him. Don't say it. Don't say anything. Go, oh, Inga. December 1st, 1915. Inga's gone, and who knows what will happen to us now. The family can stay with their Uncle Murphy, who runs a store in Crosby. But Ole and Adelaide are farmers. There'll be fish out of water in town.
You're not helping anything, you know. And you are. No, I'm not. I'm doing the only thing I can do. Tend to my own business. Good for you, John. Wake up, Ray. Wake up, Ray. Come on. Feeling pretty sorry for yourself. Uh, not for that. Instead of this, could have been up in Wildwoods where we needed a man. Let's go get some coffee. Come on. December 15th, 1915. This was supposed to be my wedding day. John's no help. All he talks about is money. He's still holding our grain off the market, waiting for prices to go up, so we're broke. The worse things get, the more Sven and Howard lean on me about organizing in Wild Rose. I'm going to bed. Ray, don't do anything stupid. I can't roof by myself. And they'll be all right without your help.
I'm going. I'm going, John. Is the league going to roof this barn for us? Is the league going to sweet talk for us? I think they're getting our loan. I've got to have it this week, Ray. I've got to. We're going to lose this place. You're right. I'm right. So you'll stay. And that's why I'm going to go, because I'm not going to let fellas like Forsythe steal another farm. That's ours included. seen her a couple of times since the foreclosure, so it was a welcome relief to go up to Crosby for a weekend. I found that Murphy's store is being boycotted by local businessmen as a hotbed of league activity. And one of these grain commission boys and throw in a railroad man, put him in a barrel, roll it down the hill, and you know there'd be a son of a bitch on the top every time. <laughs> Murphy is planning a meeting about the problem, and Inga is helping with preparations. to do. Well, we better get busy. is it? 8.30. That's kind of a personal question there. Well, I know you do. Uh, I've got a little one with him. You. Now, what happens if uh, you get in the hole and he decides to foreclose on you? And there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Well, he'd have to grow a mite before he foreclose on me. Yeah, but if you get in the hole, he can do it. Well, I'm not in the hole yet. See, I've got the same problems. If I want to be able to get the price I want for my grain, something's going to have to change. That's what the league is trying to do. I, I just don't see where it's going to do us much good. I'll tell you what I'll do. He and you're so serious about this thing, I'll make you an offer. I'll wrestle you for it. And if I pin you, you get out of here and leave me and Harry alone. If you pin me, we'll join up with you. You game for that?
Sodbuster. You just lost, you dumb cowboy. How you figure that, Sodbuster? You just lost. Jag vill att han ska bora här om jag ska behålla känslorna. Ja, Inga, det är svåra tider. Jag vet inte själv vad som händer. För tre veckor sedan så... Knut kom inte hem. Han var borta i tre dagar. Jag vet inte var han var någonstans. Jag var så nervös. Hade jag inte haft ungarna så hade jag varit helt förstörd. Men när han kom, ja då hade han varit med de andra bönderna och de hade suttit och pratat och de måste hjälpa varandra. De hade varit borta i Ambrose. Men folk behöver hjälpa varandra. Det ligger någonting i luften. Vi behöver hjälpa varandra just nu. Jag tror det. Jag vet inte vad kvinnorna... Jag vet inte vad kvinnans plats är längre. Jag vet inte vad vi kan gå. Och vad vi kan göra. Men vi kan göra något. Tror jag. Det hoppas jag med. No more rocks. There's more of them out in the field. Oh, come on, Chris. Give me a break. So you can pick them up, too, at the same time. <laughs> well, why don't we come and, come and talk with me? Yeah, all right. All right, all right I'll do that. I'll, I'll get over there with you. So, I don't think you're very smart when you come out to the farm and hold rocks. I did it to, to, to show you that, that we were working for you. That we want to work yeah. for the farmers. Oh, well, you figured you could trick me into joining up, huh? We're not trying to trick you into anything. We're we're farmers ourselves. We're Yeah, but I think uh, you guys are too slick to deal with. I mean, if you get in the hole and the bank forecloses, there's no one to help you right now. Yeah, but a small farmer is better off stay by himself. Well... Well, you're a mighty stubborn man, Chris. No, I'm pretty hard to get. I gotta study it out and figure it out. Okay, you do that. You yeah. do that. See how it'll work. Well, we're right. pretty stubborn too, you know. Well, you gotta be stubborn once in a while. <laughs> so I'm gonna see you when I come back through. I don't think they're doing any good. Well, I'm in. Here, uh, I'll see you. Well, I'll go by then. February 5th, 1916. When I got back to Crosby, all I wanted to do was see Inga. But Murphy, always the staunch socialist, was starting to wonder about the League, so I had to hear him out. I'm worried about Tomley. He's out telling people anything to get their six dollars and nobody can control him anymore. What do you mean? What do you mean? He doesn't have a long-range plan. All he wants to do is get the six dollars for the membership. And when Tomley and, 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 uh, and Tiger and those fellows from the Socialist Party, they went out and started organizing farmers and they were successful and uh what happened they got booted out of the socialist party socialists just don't like success that's all no no that isn't true right? it's true i've never met a i've never met a successful socialist. no i know They're, they all think we're crazy you know what's going on Murphy, i don't care what you say as far as i'm concerned how is that where did you hear that i've heard him my 
Mama says he hates the city. He just sits in his room all day. He worked in a factory for a while. But they laid him off. He doesn't even talk to the kids anymore. morning, Inga and I went back to the farm together. The price of wheat finally went up to $1.12 a bushel, so John came up to Crosby to sell. It looked like his waiting tactics had finally paid off. I came up from Wild Rose to help him at the elevator, but the roads were bad and I got in late. Come on, come on, just the Nobody else is going to give you meat like this. You can't find meat like this. Sorry, but I'd like to, but that's all I can do. Number four. Now... Now, very good. Look, Elmer, just calm down. He's not number four. Well, don't blame me for the snow. But there's no damage. Look at the stuff. All I know is you're thrashed in the snow. Now, look, John, I'm a businessman. I have to sell this stuff in Minneapolis after I buy it from you. Now, very good. This is going to ruin me. Oh, come on, look at it, goddammit! This is number one in North Dakota! Take it easy! Come on, take it easy. I checked every saccharine. That's beautiful beating there. You are some booster. You never give up, do you? He 
Scotty can get along without choosing sides, just as I once had. But it didn't take a genius to figure out why Gordon had rejected our wheat. Sven and Howard had been downgraded too. If we can't sell our grain, we'll go under, probably before planting time. When Uncle Tor heard what had happened, he was furious. He set up a meeting for Howard and me with some of the key men over at Chris Torse and Soddy. All right, let me, uh, let me ask you fellas a question then. If you buy a pound of coffee, who sets the price for that coffee? God only knows, Ray. God set the price to the coffee you buy, Gordon? No, I ain't the boss, and then his missus, and that missus, she's, <laughs> one week she'll have it a cent up, and the next week it'll be another cent up. Also, and... also, Andy's missus sets the price. Is that what you're trying to tell me, huh? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, but where does she get the coffee? I, uh, I threw them for uh, them cheaper coffee than the rest of her. Who is that? I think that has to be Ted. Mine not brings it up. About once a week or so? No, uh, I don't think it comes that often. I think it's more like more once a month. Oh, I almost had in my head it was just once a week, or well, twice a week. No, it's only once a week. <laughs> beside that, I mean, that's beside the point. Does Ted set the price? He's just a salesman. Just a salesman. Just a salesman. That's right, he just works for another company. And what about that company? The dead company, yes. No, oh, but are they in there alone? Are they doing it all by themselves? No, no, the must do the company. They were sending it out to send it to others. Yeah. Also the small, small, uh, store company, them, them tar in, in for chains to the small company, tar profit, uh, us, us all us go the whole way up, dearer and dearer. Some little, some can study, have a little to, uh, some stacker folk who can buy it, you know? Yeah, and the railroads are involved there too. They're getting their costs. You can bet your boots about that. So, I mean, you got so many things there, uh, it gets pretty confusing, maybe, uh, Maybe God does set the price. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, what it comes down to, what you're paying is the cost of bringing the coffee into Minneapolis, the cost of processing and packaging it there, the cost of bringing it into North Dakota, the cost of distributing it throughout the whole state, and then finally, on top of that, yeah, and then, Mrs. then you got Mrs. Ingwilson yeah. putting her five cents, five or ten cents on top of that, right? That's what you're paying. That's what's setting the price. And the kicker in the whole thing, though, is where does that coffee really come from? It comes from Brazil. That's where it's grown. I understand that he tried to say that the coffee is just as good as Kveten was. We send it to Øst and get it up and send it back and all together for a big profit. And that's what he tried to say. Farming is the only business where you buy retail, you sell wholesale, lower than wholesale. You have no control over your product at all. You're, you're just a damn slave. And that's what the league's all about, and that's what we're trying to change. We can't do it without the farmers. Ray, you're uh, pretty sharp there, Ray. Yeah, for not even having a high school education. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there are many of them who are after your money and try to get everything you have. Ha, 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 ha. Yeah, but it's not how we say it, it's what we say and that's the truth. Yeah. Når presten preker, så forandrer han ikke spifta hver gang. I opened my Bible and it brought back old times. I could hear mother's teardrops on every line. There on the pages a fragment still laid. Of a faded blue ribbon and a lilac bouquet.
been busy and haven't seen Inga at all. She writes that Murphy's going to Minot this weekend, so we'll have the house to ourselves. Going to stop in at Gordon's first, though. Sven and I are meeting with some Kenmare farmers about the upcoming nominating conventions. After that, no more politics until Monday. <laughs> Inga, vad vill du göra? Jag måste gå nu. Men du måste tala om för honom. Du måste göra det. was always gone. As soon as the harvest was over, he'd be out on the road selling books. To make ends meet, he said. He was a terrible salesman. So silent and tall. I think people were afraid of him. He just wanted to get away. Mother and I sat alone on the farm all winter, trying to keep the girls happy. Mother never said what she was feeling. You don't complain, you know, it isn't done. and worry. You can worry and fret it to death. 
The roof needed mending. The fence wasn't fixed. The cistern leaked. The chimney needed cleaning. And wasn't somebody going to do something about it so that you wouldn't have to worry all the time? But you never said. You never spoke up. Never once in that good God-fearing home ever said what you meant. I'm lonesome. I want him there when I turn over at night. I want him. I need him. looked at your face, right? So hard and stiff. That's the way Papa's face was. Maybe I've loved you because of it. You said love it. trying to love you. But you love what you're doing. It'll end. I promise you. The people you're fighting don't give up, Ray. If we win, we'll be fighting them off for the rest of our lives. And if we lose, We lose, we'll have each other. It's not enough. No, it isn't. Must have got a raise. Boy, are you ever looking sharp. Hey, you gonna be a little nervous tonight? Never mind about that. Just make sure you're there tonight. I'll be there. Don't worry about that. I'll be there. Don't worry, we'll be there. I'll pull them for you. Okay, well, I'll see you fellas tonight then. Yeah. Okay. Well, folks, we're all here together tonight to meet a man we've all heard about. If he was an old gang politician, I would stand up here and talk about how great a fella he was until you fell asleep like you do in church. But I can't do that. Lucky for me, he's a farmer. So now I'd like to introduce you to the next governor of the state, farmer, Leaguer, our friend, Lynn J. Fraser.
election eve 1916. Last night a terrible storm hit most of the state. All day we've been moving from farm to farm, helping people dig out and feed their livestock. Then get their cars and rigs going so they can go to town and vote. Telephone and telegraph wires are down all over the state, so we have no idea what's happening in other areas. We can only hope that everyone is doing the same thing we are, getting the farmers to the polls by whatever means possible. Well, I guess the crooks made it. They fixed it. This morning, the Sioux came in with the Fargo newspapers. The league had lost badly in all the eastern cities. It seemed impossible that all our efforts could end this way. mail train came in. The rural vote had turned things around. set our sights ahead to the general elections in the fall. Much work remains to be done, and there isn't much time to celebrate. But as John and I drove back to the farm tonight, we felt, for the first time in our lives, powerful. But leave it to the powers that be. They don't get there by accident. The long-feared letter from Forsyth was there when we got back. The mortgage is up, and no elevator in the area will accept our wheat. Even if the league wins in September, help from the farmer's government will still be months away. Forsyth has played his last card. But it's a good one.
Inga came out to the farm when she heard about the foreclosure. Inga. I know. You struggle for a good life and you never get to live it. Where are you going now? me up in Fortuna. I'll be in Crosby for the election. I'll see you there then. I picked up Howard and we headed for Fortuna up near the Montana border. Who can say what is coming next? But win or lose, I'm a part of it. I have a place.
of these days, they'll go too far. And, well, you know what I'm talking about. I'm an optimist, and I know the good comes out of the bad. Things are going to change, I'm sure of it. I've got time. I can wait. <laughs>